Now, to begin my story, I want to begin with a polemic, which is a polemic precisely about hubris in the area of wisdom. The polemic is the Bishop Berkeley's The Analyst, or a discourse addressed to an infidel mathematician. Now, in it, Berkeley is concerned with the foundations of the calculus. But what he's really aiming at is analyzing the claims of the geometers using the calculus. Now, what does this have to do with wisdom? It's certainly a question of mathematics. Well, it comes back to the claim the analysts were making to themselves at the beginning of the 18th century, that they were presumed to be, of all men, the greatest masters of reason. They claim math, and here he glosses their claim, that mathematics provides, quote, a habit of reasoning, close and exact and methodical, which habit strengthens the mind, and being transferred to other subjects, is of general use in the inquiry after truth. This is a conception that is enormously widely shared at the beginning of the 18th century. And so the way mathematics was understood to epitomize good reasoning is that it provided you, quote, a perpetual well-connected chain of consequences, the objects being kept in view, and the attention ever fixed upon it. So mathematics was not only formally certain, in the, in the English of the day, it had a certain kind of justness, but more almost as, in many cases more importantly, it was evidence preserving, evidence is the term. The ideas and their connections were ever present to the mind. Now this conception of mathematics is deeply problematic. It creates a huge number of philosophical issues and it's deeply problematic in understanding much of the actual mathematical practice of the day, particularly at the cutting edge. And yet, it's enormously important philosophically and pedagogically throughout the period. Berkeley's argument is that neither is true in the calculus. It's neither formally certain, and it does not preserve evidence. Indeed, he comes to argue that in some sense, uh, the mathematicians symbol bashing does work, and he tries to explain why it works and why it produces certain kinds of results. But what it doesn't ever do is habituate anyone to reasoning well. The upshot then for Berkeley of the problems of the foundations in the calculus were that the fundamental principles of the new mathematics were no more evident than those of faith. And this was enormously important for him because he was arguing against the people that he thought of as free thinkers who argued that either for the non-existence of God, but much more likely they argued for the rational basis of a kind of deist God. Now, what does this relate to a larger story of the Enlightenment? And in the book I'm writing with the aid of this grant, I'm concerned not particularly with Barclay. I'm in fact mostly concerned with all the hubristic people that he so despises, all the people who in one way or another think that mathematics is an essential component to being the kind of person um, who has wisdom. In the Enlightenment, mathematics had this sort of Janus nature. It was at once a paradigm of certain and evident reasoning, and yet it was simultaneously a dangerous, baroque, formal game, something that undermines enlightenment. This tension this tension in which the contribution of mathematics to enlightenment and to wisdom, um, I'm arguing in my book, is precisely what allows, in some sense, the internal history of mathematics and the philosophy of mathematics to be as rich as it is.